Hello, how is everyone? Great. I love Gail's book. Is this campus in Gail? Am I currently in Galesburg? Yeah, yeah. Okay, no. Galesburg is like my second home. So you, you'll find out soon why in a moment. Um, so I start off my, my speech with a slide that basically says, I wonder how many people I've looked at all my life and never seen. You know, when I was a kid, I felt very disconnected. I felt um, very lonely. Uh, and as I became a young adult, I continued to feel very lonely, um, very disconnected. And I never understood why. I never understood that everything that I was chasing wasn't going to get me to where I needed to be. But now I do, and I'm going to share it with you. So sometimes people say to me, they say, what is the greatest lesson that you have learned whilst you've been traveling the world? Because I've visited 90 countries, I spend most of my time on the road, and the way I answered that question was that we are all the same. It does not matter how much money you have, it does not matter how much, where you live, what color you are, all these things are irrelevant. Because ultimately, what we all want is simply to be seen. And what I mean by seen is really the power, the healing power of human connection. I'm sure there are people in this room who felt seen at times. I'm sure there are people in this room that have felt unseen. And when we feel seen, when we feel that another human being actually understands us, hears us, loves us, that is when we can truly create magic in our lives and in other people's lives. And being seen with human connection is not just about humanity's connection with each other, it's about nature. Who has a pet? So if you have a pet, you know how, how much love and how much connectivity you can have with that one creature. So truly, my whole speech today, although I'm going to tell you some funny stories, I think they're funny anyway. Um, is about the power of being seen. Because without that, that's when darkness comes. Who has an iPhone or an iPod or an iTouch or something? Okay. I went to a restaurant a couple of days ago and I saw eight people sitting at a table and every single one of them was on the phone. Every single one of them. Now there's nothing wrong with our phones. Our phones can create connections, but truly, when we become obsessed with our phones, which pretty much all of us are, we lose out the most powerful thing, which is just connecting with each other. And I find that I actually have two phones. One of my phones is this. And I have this because I know I'm obsessed with technology, like we all are. But when I travel, I do have an iPhone. <laughs> but I try not to take it out with me at night. But my point is that although we have Facebook, although we have Twitter, although we have Instagram, although we have all these things, the true connection, the true power, is when we are just one on one or in a group, or in an energetic field like this. That is where the true magic lies. So you may be asking yourself, why is an Englishman in Galesburg? And why is he standing here in front of you giving a speech? I'm about to clear up that mystery. I used to be a broker in the city of London, very disconnected, very depressed. On the outside, I had everything, everything. On the inside, I had nothing. 
spiritually, emotionally bankrupt. Yet I was wearing a mask, like we all do. We go out in the world, I'm fine, everything's good. But the truth is that everything is not good, many times. And I would walk into that office every day, living someone else's life, living someone else's dreams. And I remember very clearly, I woke up one day, again, on the outside I had everything. I woke up one day and I thought to myself, this is, this is it. This is going to be my life for the rest of my days. I'm going to live in a depressed fashion. I'm not going to follow my dreams. I'm not going to do what I want to do. And no one is ever going to get a chance to get through my mask. And in that moment, I gave up. In that moment, I gave up. A couple of days went by. I thought back to that moment, like those three days, giving up. I know I'm not allowed to swear in this room, so I'm not going to swear. But I, but I said, I said to myself, I said, you know what? F it. I'm not giving up. I'm going to do everything in my power to make sure that I live a life that is inspirational, that I live a life that touches people in a positive way, and that I live a life with as much fun as humanly possible. I am not giving up. Now, it didn't just happen like that. So I continued at the work, continued at the job. And then something happened. You know, sometimes random things can go a long way to changing your life. Who has heard of the Motorcycle Diaries? Okay. So for those of you who haven't, it's a romanticized version of Che Guevara traveling around South America relying entirely on the kindness of strangers. And I remember I was supposed to go, I had, in those days I would wear a suit. I'm actually pretty well dressed for, for my current life. I would wear a suit and I was going out to a meeting and the meeting was cancelled. It's like school, when you get the message on the tannoy, school is leaving early. I went back home, turned on the TV and this movie came on. And I sat there for two and a half hours and I watched this movie, and something happened inside me. As I was watching, I was like, I think I'm having an epiphany, as I was watching, and as I was crying as well, to be honest with you. And I put this, this picture up, because to me, this epitomized everything I wanted, which was connection, which was freedom, which was adventure, which was purpose, um, because Che, again the romanticized version of Che, went around relying on kindness. And his father wanted him to be a doctor. And in the movie he turned around to his dad and says, no, I'm leaving, that's it. And he goes out and he helps people and he connects with people. And it's all about that inspirational act of connectivity. So I put this up here because that was what I wanted. That was what I wanted. And I knew in that moment, even though it was a movie, I knew that there was another way to live. There was another way to live. And that was how I wanted to live. And I'll tell you today, that is how I live. True. Not all the time, because I'm not perfect. But most of the time, that's how I live. And I then made a rather odd decision. And that decision was I was going to quit my job. I'd had enough. I'd had enough. One of the most important lessons I've learned along my trips is about pain. And we'll suffer pain. We're human beings. There's no way of getting away from that. But most of us don't share that pain. Most of us don't connect with someone else about that pain. We shut down and we just let it sit there, but it grows and it grows and it grows. And when I give my speeches at schools, I talk about the importance of sharing your pain, sharing it with someone safe. It can truly change your life and change someone else's life just by telling someone. 
I am in pain. Can you help me? That can change the direction of your life. So my way of sharing my pain at the beginning was by quitting my job and by doing this crazy journey where I was going to walk across America relying on the kindness of strangers. But that sounds like a really good idea when you're sitting on your couch at home. <laughs> but it's not such a good idea when you actually arrive in America with no money. My aim was to walk from Times Square to the Hollywood sign, $5 in my pocket, relying on people like you. And as I look back, I realize why I did that. I took away my money, so I would be forced to connect. There was no hope except if I connected with you. And that leads, leads me to why it is that Gail's Boat is my second home. I arrived in Galesburg during one of my journeys and I, I was in the middle of the street. I'm going to exaggerate, well, I'm going to exaggerate the story, sorry. I have to. This part of the story, anyway. I nearly got run over by Bob's mum. Um, <laughs> and she said, to, she called her son Bob and uh, introduced us and said, look, take, can you take him out for lunch? And we did that. And yeah, I ended up staying the night with Bob in this house, with Karen, and their two lovely daughters. And the next morning, I said to Bob, I need to get to West. And he's like, let's go around the whole town and try and raise some money. I couldn't accept money. So, raise money for a ticket to, to Denver. So Bob goes around the whole town, and the town of Denver, Galesburg, raises $110. And I end up, in two hours, and I end up getting on a train all the way to Denver because of Bob. And you, actually. Maybe some of you guys have helped me. I have no idea. Did you help me? Did? No, I don't think you did. Anyway. Um, so, and I keep coming back. keep coming back to Galesburg. Last night I stayed with Bob and his wife. Such a beautiful thing. It's like a random meeting has created this lifelong friendship. And that's what it's all about, really, about connectivity. So I arrived in LA and I thought to myself that I was going to, everything was going to work itself out. LA is a place where people go to make their dreams come true, or it's a place where people go and their dreams die. Unfortunately, that's what happens. Um, I ended up sitting behind a desk again. And I ended up doing things I didn't want to do. It was probably the wrong path again. But then something quite profound happened. I was walking down the street, and I saw this homeless man with a sign. And the sign said, kindness is the best medicine. And there was something in that moment. Kindness is the best medicine. And I realized, again, that I was doing not what I wanted to do. Again, I was not connecting with people. Again, I was not you know, in the magic of humanity. So I came up with this crazy idea on my way home that I was going to buy a vintage yellow motorbike. I was going to call it Kindness One, like Air Force One, but yellower. I was going to have no money, no food, no place to stay, no gas, nothing, except the kindness of people. But this time was going to be a twist, and a twist was going to be the unsuspecting Good Samaritans who are going to receive a life-changing gift. Bob, I'm really sorry that I didn't come up with this idea with you. Because Bob, the only gift Bob got was me who didn't get a life-changing gift. Um, and I thought to myself, this is a brilliant, brilliant idea. So I went home to my girlfriend. And I was like, look, I'm doing this trip. I'm going to do this and do that. I'm going to be away for six months. And at the point where I said I was going to be away for six months, the tears started. And in that moment, I didn't realize that she was going to be so upset. A couple of months ago, a lady came up to me after my speech. She said, you don't understand me, do you? And I was like, I guess not. But now I understand a little bit better. Not fully. It's another little mystery that one has to work with. So that was my journey. I had to pay for my visas, 
I had to pay for my passport on my bike, and I had to find a ship to cross the oceans, which I did after many, many weeks of failure. I finally found one person to help me. But the true meaning of this journey was not about me. The true meaning of this journey was about people like us. So I was in Pittsburgh, and I ended up chatting with this chap. I said to him, is there any way I can live in your house tonight? Which is a bit odd. Well, actually, it's not that odd. I asked you. And you said yes. <laughs> um, <laughs> actually, I remember Bob, he, he, he said, look, I have to call my wife and my children and find out whether they approve. And you call them up and they approve. But from what I understand, Karen and her kids were like, what's wrong with Bob? Like he's bringing some random Englishman back to the house. But anyway, maybe Bob used to do those kind of things and still does. Back to Tony. I said to him, can I live in your house? And he says to me, I'm really sorry, but I'm homeless. So in that moment, I felt a lot of shame. I was like, look, I'm doing this social experiment. But here's a man who knows nothing. But he did something truly extraordinary in that moment. And he said to me, you know what, if you want, you can come and stay with me tonight. I'll protect you, I'll feed you, and I'll give you some clothes. My mind was like, don't do this. I don't sleep on the streets with, with this man. But my heart and my intuition said, you have to do this. You have to. So I did. I went and I stayed in the streets of Tobin. And he did everything he said he would do, but he did more. He taught me the most powerful lesson, and that is that true wealth is not in our wallets, but it is in our hearts. Does that mean that money is not important? No, money is very important. But I have met many penniless millionaires in my time, and then I have met people like Tony, someone who on the outside had nothing, but on the inside he had everything. Next morning, I said to him, Tony, how did you sleep tonight, last night? He's like, I didn't sleep at all. I'm like, why? Why didn't you sleep so long? He's like, because I spent the whole night taking parts of you. So the bikes crawling the road as they do in the streets when you're out there. And in that moment I realized I have to give back to this chap. In some way I have to give back to him. He had no idea. Unsuspecting which man it is. So I said to him, I said, I'd like to take you somewhere where you felt loved. And he thinks about it for a moment. And he says, I felt loved at school. And I was like, really? Obviously, this chap can go to an English school, an English boarding school, at that. I, like, I took him in the bike and I explained to him what was happening. And I told him that I wanted to get back to him. So I had the honor of being able to put him up in an apartment and being able to send him back to school. He always wanted to be a chef. And sometimes to this day, Tony calls me up. And he says to me, you changed my life. And I say to him, my friend, it is you who changed my life. Because that is what happened on that day. Tony changed my life. And he simply changed my life by enabling me to come to my heart. The truth is I wouldn't be sitting up here in front of you. I wouldn't be doing all the speeches that I do if it wasn't for him. Because he opened up my heart and he showed me the ocean of goodness that is in every single one of us. Each one of us has a choice. That's the truth. We have a choice as to how we want to show up in the world. Whether we want to show up in a good way, or whether we want to show up in a bad way. I did a speech at a school in, um, in Sedona, and after the speech, uh, this girl sent me a Facebook message. With, with the kids, it's more about bullying, about you know, being kind to each other. And she turns around to me and she says, I want to thank you, because the bully, who's been bullying me since eighth grade, came up to me today and said sorry. Said to me, you look beautiful. 
carry my bags to my next class. Every single one of us has the power to affect change in a positive way. Another story from school. An Indian girl who spent three months of her exchange program was sitting behind the gymnasium eating by herself. She says to me, Mr. Leon, I want you to know that I've been here for three months and I do not have a single friend. But after your speech, two people came up to me and said, Will you be my friend? Now I have two friends. And a couple of days later, she says to me, Mr. Leon, I want you to know I now have four friends. So again, every single one of us can affect some change. It's up to us how we, how we approach the world. It's up to us how we walk into our lives and share with others. It's up to us. So with Tony, I may have been able to give him an opportunity that he wouldn't have had, but he gave me an opportunity that I would never have had. Or maybe it would have taken five more years, or maybe it would have taken ten more years. But he opened up my heart. He opened up my heart. When I see you, my heart smiles. Actually, I just like this slide, that's why I didn't put this up. It's just a beautiful thing. When I see you, my heart smiles. Okay. I, I know how to travel. And I know how to have fun. But I'm very disorganized. And there's a slide that's missing. <laughs> so, we're going to pretend that there was a slide of a Vietnamese border card with me crying on his shoulders right there. And then we're going to get to this slide. So as I told you, I was traveling around the world. Good news happened, bad news happened. Sometimes people rejected me, sometimes people didn't. When I arrived at the Vietnamese border, who's been to Vietnam? Steve. <laughs> Steve has been to Vietnam. So I arrived at the Vietnamese border. And remember I told you about my visa and my passport. I go to the guy at the, the desk, he looks at my visa, he's like, mm, okay, and smiling. He looks at my, my, my passport for the bike, and he's like, he's not smiling. And I'm like, that is pretty bad. And then he turns around and he says, you, yes, bike, no. This is bad, you, yes, bike, no. I've traveled 17,000 miles with that little yellow bike of mine, and he's not letting the bike in. So I say, look, let me speak to the chief. So a little chief guy comes out, and I say, I tried charming with my Englishness, which seems to have worked throughout the whole journey so far. But this chap doesn't like the English, uh, so my charm doesn't work. He says, no, you're not getting the bike. I'm like, okay. I say, look, chief, give me a bigger chief. So the bigger chief comes out, and I go to DEFCON 3. DEFCON 3 was me telling the bigger chief, look, my kids, they need me. Their father is away. Without the bike, they're going to suffer. I don't have any kids, and he didn't give me the bike. So I was like, OK, DEFCON 2. I said, big chief, give me the biggest chief you have. DEFCON 2 was look at my wife. My wife, I need, my wife needs me, she's gonna divorce me unless I give me the bike. Uh, I don't have a wife, didn't have a wife, and he didn't give me the bike. So then it was like DEFCON 1 time. DEFCON 1, as you know, is war. I was going on a kindness war. And I said, I was like, look, what am I going to do? The only way to get this guy to help me is to make him feel for me. I'm actually embarrassed about what I thought about doing with DEFCON 1. Um, look, I basically decided that in that moment, I was going to like, fake passing out. And that he was going to feel so sorry for me that the man was going to give me the bike. I didn't fake, fake uh, passing out. He didn't give me the bike. But the reason why I share this story is, is really for one, one reason. Because I was saved by the Americans. 
same body miracles. Any choice? Do I go to the American Embassy or do I go to the British Embassy? I know I'm being filmed, so I'm going to be careful what I say here. But I felt that if I went to the British Embassy, I may not get as much love as if I went to the American Embassy. Because I've traveled across America multiple, multiple times. Met so many wonderful people. There's a generosity of spirit in this country that's truly second to none. So I went to the Embassy. No children, no wives, no lies, nothing. Truth. I told them everything, including the gifts. And believe it or not, it reached the level of the US ambassador to Vietnam. I had pissed off an entire nation, but I was saved by the American embassy. I got the bike out, and I ended up getting back to North America because of the Americans. Without the American help, the bike would still be there. Literally, it would still be there. So now back to this slide. So I was in Vietnam, and um, I remember very clearly, I met this lady at uh, a noodle shop, and she invited me for a bowl of noodles. But what she did next was the most powerful thing. Who's ever, who knows someone or has, uh, has ever had cataract surgery? A few of us. In America, in the Western world, if you have cataracts, it's pretty easy to resolve. I mean, for most of us. Yeah? Pretty easy. Not too expensive. It's all good. In Vietnam, that is not the case. This is a doctor who dedicated his life every single day to giving back. Every day. He uses his expertise to give free eyesight surgery to poor Vietnamese farmers every day. And I was truly astonished by this. And sometimes I become a little bit, I, I do things and say things that I may not, I should, probably shouldn't do. And I remember feeling like this surge of like desire to help him. So I said, I will help you with 100 surgeries. And then I was like, did I really just say that? Because now I've totally bankrupted myself and I really wish I did not say that. But I did, I was like, yes, I did say that. Then I was like, how much are the surgeries, please? This, will you please just tell me they're not alone? Turns out that the surgery for cataracts is $30 in Vietnam. And every single person that you see in that picture, apart from me, who for some reason isn't looking very smiley, <laughs> without a doctor like that, would be blind and would stay blind, and that would be it. And simply for thirty dollars, you can change your life in Vietnam. For thirty dollars, truly astonishing, truly, truly astonishing. Okay. In a moment, I'm going to show you a video of, of, my, of my escapades. But before I do, I want to explain truly why I'm sitting here, standing here in front of you. Because everything came full circle in one moment. It enabled me to be here today. I am prone to melodrama. I have to admit that. Steve will tell you. Am I prone to melodrama? <laughs> Bob will tell you the truth. Yes, I am prone to, and his wife is. I am prone to melodrama. Yeah. So I was sitting outside these, uh, this building in Vietnam. I had no idea what it was. It was just a building. And I was having a melodramatic moment because my bike was impounded, my journey was coming to an end, and I was making it 20 times worse in my head. And a guy comes out and he says, Are you okay? And I was like, yeah, I guess, yeah, I'm fine. And he says, well, this is the opera house. Would you like to come tonight to the opera? I mean, who gets an invitation in Vietnam in Ho Chi Minh City to go to the opera? I was like, yeah, sure, why not? I haven't got any money, but yeah. He's like, no worries. So I end up going to the opera that night. He takes me to the top of the, the bleachers, let's say. He sits me down, he says, enjoy. Ten minutes before the end, he comes and knocks me, taps me on the shoulder. He says, 
says, I want you to be in the show. This guy obviously never heard me sing and never heard me play a musical instrument because I couldn't tell him about that. But I say, sure. He says, I want you to go out there and play your heart out. Go out there and play your heart out. He's like, okay. So I go, he gives me like a drum, it's Vietnamese drum. He dresses me up and I go out there and I play my heart out. And at the end, there's a standing ovation, not because I was good, but because I was the only white chap on the stage, and it was obvious that something weird was going on, and I was terrible, so there was a pity standing ovation. But in that moment, I felt seen. Just in that one moment. And I went back, and I thought about Tony. I thought about how one of the things I gave him was just to see him, just for those six, seven, eight, nine, ten hours, however long I was with him, just to see him. And I realized how important it was to be seen. And it took a crazy, random, yellow motorbike adventure for me to realize that. And that doesn't mean that we all have to do that kind of adventure, we don't. But that's what it took this time, to realize the power of being seen. So now I want to show you a little video. There.
try and open up for some questions. I want to finish with one, one story. And that is, again, from the school that I, I was exposed to. And again, a reminder about the importance of letting out your pain and a reminder of how one person's words can truly change a life. Truly. So I gave a speech. During the speech, this 15-year-old girl puts her hand up and says, can I give you a hug? Sure, of course you can give me a hug. And she sends me a Facebook message. And she says to me, Leon, first of all, I want to thank you for coming to my school. And secondly, when I left the auditorium, I started to cry. And a boy came up to me and said, it's okay to cry. Who knows what effect that one boy had on that girl, simply by validating to her that her pain is okay. And by seeing that, it's okay to cry. Every single one of us can leave this room and has a choice to make. How do you want to show up in the world? Do you want to show up with your heart open? Or do you want to show up with your heart closed? It's your choice. Thank you. Sunday when I'm in LA, I take it on a little spin. Yeah. <laughs> sure, 
I had anything really bad happen to me while I'm out. When I was uh, about 22, I was in Thailand. And um, I don't know if you've been to Thailand, but they have these things called rickshaws, tuk-tuks, the little taxis that are open air. I was with a friend. And the tuk-tuk guy comes up and says, hey, let me take you, let me take you. And I say to my friend, I said, you know what? Let's not go there. There's something about that chap I don't feel right about. It. He's like, no, let's go. I'm like, let's not go there. Trust me, it's not right. He's like, no, let's go. I was like, you know what? All right, fine, whatever, let's go. He ended up taking us to an illegal opium den. And I share that story because it enabled me to have this level of intuition. It's the first lesson I had. Follow the intuition. So I don't put myself in situations. I, tell, I take calculated risks. I don't think they're silly, but some people may think that driving a yellow motorbike around the world is silly. Um, but I don't allow myself to get into situations. I feel out the room, I feel out the situation. I'm like, oh, okay, there's something not right about this, let's move this way. That doesn't mean that that's always gonna keep you safe. Sometimes bad things happen even with your intuition. I was in India, five days after I left this town called Patna, a bomb went off exactly where I was and killed eight people. So, you never know, you never know. But to answer your question, not really, because I always, Kind of figure out a situation and yes, and no, and I follow my instinct. Tony, like I said, my mind was like, don't do it, but my, my heart was like, you're going to be okay. I was thinking to myself when I was doing it, if I told my mum what I was doing, she would be like, what are you doing? Don't do this, go somewhere else. But I just felt it was right. If I could revisit anywhere, well, the answer is Galesburg because I keep coming back. Uh, apart from Galesburg, I would say Bhutan. Bhutan is a place where they do gross, they have a thing called gross national happiness. They determine the success of the country, not by how much money they make, but out of the happiness of the people. Now, don't ask me what the algorithm is because I have no idea but it just works. Because I, the people I met in Bhutan had a sense of joy. It was truly exceptional, even their hearts, in such a wonderful way. South Africa to Finland in a yellow Land Rover, doing basically what I did in the Kindness Diaries, but instead of me giving gifts, it will be you. It will be done on, a, on Yahoo on a platform. I will go and film the, the, the people who need help, and you will get the opportunity to fund their dreams. One dollar, three dollars, five dollars, however many dollars you want, up until you reach the goal, and then they will, their dreams will be funded. Is y'all your favorite color? 
Yellow. Yellow, my favorite color. Actually, red is my favorite color. Although my belt is partially yellow. Um, yellow is the universal color of happiness. You know the smiley face is yellow? That's why I chose yellow. Well, oh, I know you have a question. Feel it. Feel your question. Make it, make, make it a good one. Make it a good one. Yeah, I always do this. Actually, by the way, I just want to let this out to you. The Britishness is very charming. We all love that. It definitely helps me. So, if I'm on a pilgrimage, try to fake a British accent. Even if we do take the companies from you. We gave them back to you. stayed and listened. It's more, I challenge each and every one of you to find the kindness in your heart to be an inspiration to one person be, to become the ripple in the pond that spreads all across the pond and create multiple waves of kindness. See, if you can be the beginning point, like this man here has. Because he has inspired me dramatically. And, you, and the, the most humblest way to do it is not to be recognized for what you do. Do not, do not take the claim for it. Just do it and see if someone else will continue the action to pay it for. There's a generosity of spirit in America. Like, how can that be one who is down on my own country? It's hard to be happy about takes a big magnifying glass and magnifies the bad every day. Magnifies the bad. Don't get me wrong, bad things happen. We've all seen it. We've all seen it on the news. Maybe some of us have, some of us have been touched by it. But there is so much more goodness in the world. Yet the magnifying glass isn't shown on that. I spent a couple of months without watching TV. And then I turned on CNN and I was like, whoa. Like, the past three months, were they real? Did I meet all these amazing people? Was I touched by all these acts of kindness? Or should I not leave my hotel room because I'm going to get blown up? So it's, it's about not being Pollyannish in the sense that bad things do happen. They do. But good things happen far more often. For many of us, okay, if you're in a war zone, then, but even in war zones, you hear stories of goodness. You hear stories of humanity rising to, 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 to being of service. That's why Star Wars is such a beautiful movie. Because it's true. It's true. The force is with us all. And the dark side is also there, waiting to take us. We have a choice. Nelson Mandela. For 27 years, the man sat in a prison cell. Being abused, being away from his family. 27 years. If you put me in a jail cell for 27 years, I probably would not come out a happy man. But Nelson Mandela invited his jailers to his inauguration speech. Nelson Mandela put white bodyguards 
in his security detail. So don't tell me it can't be done. Doesn't mean it's easy, because it's not. But if Nelson Mandela can do it, who's a human being just like you and me, then we can go out there and just make one little ripple, as Bob said, without being perfect, because none of us are perfect. I ain't perfect. None of us. We just remember Nelson Mandela. writing is a book is a book about Bob. No. <laughs> Although Bob is going to be in my next book. It's funny. He is. Uh, my next book is called The Way of the Traveler. And it's basically all my adventures on the road and everything that I have learnt whilst taking that road and life lessons that you can take in your everyday life and use them as wise as that's what my next book is. Any more? It's going what? Going once? Going twice? <laughs> Sold! the most important item? I'm assuming you like Steve, stand up. <laughs> truly, <Aww>. truly. <laughs> you can't do things alone. Yeah? Like everyone says, oh, I'm a self-made man. I'm a self-made man. Like, well, maybe you had a mum who was really kind to you. Maybe you had someone that helped you. And the truth is, the most important thing that I had on my journeys, because all of my journeys that I've done, not all of them, most of them, I've had, I've had Steve with me. Um, what you saw filmed, Steve, keep standing up. <laughs> what, what, what you saw filmed was filmed by him. My journeys when I drove from London to Mongolia with no film crew, no nothing, was him. The journey across America was, was him. So it's funny because the motorcycle diaries, Che did it with, with his friend Bernardo, and they couldn't have done it without each other. So in many ways, the most important thing that I had when I did my journey was him. Right. Going once, going twice. <laughs> 